ready? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So the first topic is parallel programming. And that's kind of an interesting topic to talk about in Python. And I mean, well, you'll see in a moment, but the the main thing, I guess, in Python is that you are using, you're often using Python to connect packages written um, for you or written by someone else and possibly written in other languages. So the first thing when you start considering like, making your program faster, or especially if you start thinking about making it parallel, um, is to check if the libraries you're using already are parallel or not. So that's an, that's probably like the most important yeah. point of this uh, lesson. If you come away with just one thing, that's it. So yes, but we will that... talk a bit about what uh, how parallel programming actually works, what it actually does, and how it can or maybe cannot make your code faster. So. Um, Sorry, I interrupted you. Do you have something? No, no, no. Go yeah, go right ahead. Uh, so, so maybe we we can ask. Uh, I could ask, what what do we mean when we talk about parallel? Uh, what do we mean when we talk about parallel programming? Yeah. Is it like yeah, two okay. people on a keyboard or? Yeah, right. So parallel, that's called pair coding, I guess. <laughs> um, that's a slightly different thing. Uh, although that is actually a good, I, I think that's a pretty good like um, a metaphor for what the computer does or what the program does when you run it in parallel. So if you are writing some code and you want to do it twice as fast, it, hiring two programmers will make it faster, I guess, but it might not make it twice as fast. Um, but yeah, so ba the basically... The starting point, if you're thinking about making your code parallel, is that you want to make it run faster. It, it's taking too much time for one reason or another. Um, otherwise, you can just run it on a single processor and it, it will be done. So, um, so that that's like that's the starting point. We want to make it faster. If so, you if your program is fast enough, you don't need to make it parallel. And, okay. and would you say that the speed up would come from utilizing multiple processors in one computer? Yes, yeah, so when, um, so parallelization specifically, this, yeah, so you try to make it faster by essentially using multiple computers, or there are multiple processors on most computers these days. Basically, if you have a laptop desktop, you're watching this, it has four, six, eight, 12, maybe around 12 uh, processors that are on the same chip. Um, but, um, are essentially running calculations independent of each other at the same time. So um, yeah, so making your program parallel basically means all of those processes are doing something um, at the same time, so in parallel. Uh, OK, so the first thing, though, if your code is too slow, um, you kind of want to do some um, before going into parallel programming, because it can quickly become a complicated thing. Um, is to check why your code actually is slow. Where are the slow spots? Um, use some profiling tools and uh, then think about, can you use existing libraries or somehow make that part faster? And then profile it again and see what part is slow now and so on. And then when you get to the point where that's no longer helping, um, you you may think about parallel programming and then there's um. There are a cup uh, essentially like two different modes of parallelism that people generally use, and you can think about whether one or both of those will work actually in your program. So the first thing to check is if there is something that really needs to be running sequentially, like you have to know the result of the previous computation to go to the next one then you can't do those two things at the same time. So it, it's not really parallelizable. And then you just have to think of something else. Um, so there will be those parts in the code. But there will also be probably some parts in the code that where two calculations can be done at the same time. And then you can parallelize it. So OK, and, so then like, And what do you say that, like, in some cases, like, let's say you have, uh, you want to run the same same code for multiple data sets or something like that you want yeah to... so that's one example so okay. maybe you just want to run the same code for multiple different parameter values mm -hmm. um 
so you have a bunch of files that you want to process. So that's an example of something embarrassingly parallel, um, which is like, I mean, it's an interesting expression, but uh, that's kind of the official term these days. Uh, so it's the reason it's embarrassing is because you don't need to do anything to make it parallel. Uh, it just means you run the run multiple copies of the program on those different processors on on those different computers, and it's uh, you can do that by running the command multiple times, or you can uh, program it in in some uh, more fancy way to start multiple copies of the program. Um, mm. We'll probably we will see ways of doing that, but um, I mean, there's there's many ways. Um, yeah, so it's many it's like to do that. I would say that the embarrassingly parallel is usually like if you notice that in your code you happen to have a for loop at the outermost layer, and inside the for loop you have something that yeah. run a model or something. You know that you can like basically take that for loop and run it outside of the program. So basically run multiple copies of that program and, and that's why it's 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 barely called parallelism <laughs> or it's like yeah it's so so embarrassingly parallel you don't need any fancy structures so, to, to make it happen so so the main that, thing about like this embarrassingly parallel category is that the, the different processes the different copies of your program don't need to communicate at all they just do their own thing and when they finish they finish the others do not care that's embarrassingly parallel um and that is the most common situation, I think. That's that's what you will usually end up doing. It's run the same thing many times. But um, if that's not possible, then there's two other options. There's multi-threading. Multi-threading means that they are running on the same computer, but on different processors on that computer. So um, it, essentially, the thing is that they can share memory. When you have a variable in the pr program's memory, um, the other copies, so-called copies, or which are called threads, really, um, they have access to that memory. So that makes things a bit easier. That makes like sharing information between the processes a bit easier. And then there is mes message passing, um, or MPI, message passing interface, is a, like a common term people use, So, and a common framework for this. So that means you have a bunch of independent processes that can be running on different computers, and then they they send messages to each other. Um, they communicate over that over some kind of network. Or, so, or in in Python, you also have this multi-processing, and what it basically means that it the Python launches like multiple uh, processes, and then they communicate by writing like small files into memory, and then yeah, like yeah. each process reads the files, and but basically yeah. it, it launches multiple Python interpreters that each run stuff yeah so that's that's some well okay we'll come that's a python specific thing that um it's kind of, it's important and we'll we'll talk about multiprocessing in a moment i'm kind of well i'm I, well, we'll come back to it because i'm kind Should of struggling of a way of go uh, going it, and uh, check the first example of, uh, of so parallel. yeah okay so if you go down a bit there's the multi-threading example. So this is still like relatively straightforward, especially in Python, um, because essentially Python doesn't do multi-threading, but the libraries that are written for Python can do multi-threading. So if you're using NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, and so on, uh, they will be using libraries in the backend that are already multi-threaded. So, you basically, you don't need to do all that much. Just make sure you're not running a for loop in Python, but rather you are using a NumPy operation if you can. Yes, and there so, are like complicated enough NumPy operations that you can do most things yeah, without a so Python for loop. For the technical side, people who want to know how it works, basically like NumPy inside it, it it has lots of libraries or it uses lots of libraries like this linear algebra libraries and also there's like like if you think about a for loop it's like some some all values in this array or something like that there's a for loop uh, in in many of the numpy functions and those for loops have been like threaded in numpy itself and if you just tell numpy to use multiple processors it will try to Whenever you use the NumPy functions, it will try to run these for loops in parallel, and it it works behind the scenes 
so the only thing you need to tell it is this uh, OMP number of threads, which is a pretty cryptic, <laughs> uh, yeah, crypt yeah. cryptic uh, variable. But basically, what it tells is that use mul multiple processors in, and in NumPy MKL functions. So. And a third possible option. Usually, yes. those are already set so that you don't need to set them. Usually, it will NumPy will just use multiple threads. And you will see that by if you run NumPy and check how what your processor load is, that Python process will be using something like 400 or 800 percent of a CPU. Um, so that means it's it's already running on multiple. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, thre threading is also common for web applications and that sort of thing, but because they are not, well, uh, in, for scientific computing, they are they are not so relevant. We won't be going to that, but but there's like Python has lots of these async things, right? And and but they are not relevant. So let's so I'll just mention it, but. But if you see parallel using that, they are basically uh, mainly for web applications and that sort of thing. So one big thing kind of worth mentioning, like if, if you are trying to do multi-threading on your own, um, Python, I said Python doesn't do it. So it's in fact something that was kind of a choice that was made when the Python language was developed uh, or is being developed. Um, so there's something called a global interpreter log. And basically that means that there can only ever be one thread, one process running Python code. So if you want to run Python code, uh, like have multiple processes running your Python code, you actually need to start multiple Python interpreters, uh, which is exactly what the next thing will do. So this is a way around. Multiprocessing is a Python library, and it's a way around this uh, issue. So if you actually find that whatever libraries you are using are not multi-threaded. So you're not doing calculations in NumPy, um, or you are doing something a bit more complicated in Python and you know that you need to kind of split it into multiple processes. Multiprocessing is a way to do it. There's a bunch of nice libraries built uh, upon multiprocessing that might be more useful, but um, well, I guess we'll write a list into the, um, into the notes in a moment. Yeah. But we'll uh, here we'll just try to use multiprocessing. Yeah, let's let's so, let's run like we, I can. Yeah, let's run just run some here code and see what happens. So here we have an example. So we have a function. Um, I'll take that thing. So we have a function that. Uh, well, maybe you can uh, explain, and I can I can write. Well, yeah. If you if you type an out, so I mean, this is a very simple function. It just calculates the square of the number that you put in. Um, but this is a Python function on purpose. So like we're assuming that it's somehow something we cannot do in NumPy directly. And then um, map will run that function on every number in the list that you give it. So uh, you notice like it, it gives you the squares of every number. Um, mm -hmm. So one squared is one, two squared is four and so on. Six squared is 36. Um, that was really fast because mm -hmm. it, it it's a small list, but uh, it was running pure Python code. So if it was a big list, it would be a lot slower than say NumPy. And and I'll mention here that here that this might look for those people <laughs> who haven't used like functional programming kind of things. This might look a bit strange, but it's basically like a for loop. Well, <laughs> for loop in a in a in yeah, a it's, small um, space. It is running the same uh, function. Yeah to every element in the list. Yeah. So you yeah, might, kind you of might see uh, for more Pythonic version might be uh, something like uh, like this. Yeah, OK, that's the same. Yeah, this same. is basically without like without a map function. Yeah. Yeah, that's like, a good example. Yeah, the, 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 but but basically it's the same thing. But yeah. but using these maps, uh, well, yeah, so it, the reason it makes sense when we go to the um, next example. The reason we use the map function there uh, demonstrated is because multiprocessing <laughs> comes with its own version of the map function. Uh, so if you yeah, if you now import pool from multiprocessing and um, and then pool contains the map function. Oh, oh okay, uh, it's from multiprocessing import oh, yeah, pool, yeah. not with. Oops, yeah, no mistake was looking ahead already. Ah, uh, yeah. 
and then mm -hmm. yeah then you need to get a pool or yeah create yeah. a pool so so what we basically... there is a great way of of or a great explanation of why this is called pool but it's essentially a set of like set it, it gives you a set of processors that you can use to run stuff so you can run this square function with multiple processors um, it didn't actually return anything. I, I guess you have to probably it. need to store it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this does the same thing. Um, and you didn't see the speed up, of course, because it's so fast anyway. Um, so we could have a much bigger list and then you would see it. But um, so what the multiprocessing pool does, it, it takes the list it splits it up between all the processors available and then runs this uh, function on all of those. Pro so all of those processors do some part of the work, basically. Yeah, and in, in general, like I would say, like here we give a list to it, but map basically it works on any kind of like iterable thing. So in Python, you see a lot of like these iterable things, like something that at least is a iterable thing but you can have other things as well, like iterators. And and what what like map does is that basically takes something from the iterator and it runs a function on it. And if you do use the normal map function in Python, you do it one by one in one processor basically. But here we have a like a processor pool, so we have multiple processors. Uh, usually the number. Uh, number is auto decided to be the number of processors in your computer. Of course, you can set it yourself, but but you have a number of processors, and we read from the iterator, and then we like give it each yeah, processor, those, yeah, yeah, one, by one, one at a time, the different processors, yeah. So and then or we really actually when, many at a time because yes, many at a time, yeah. Is, uh, not and efficient. and and but, of yeah. course, like the the multiprocessing library then collects the results in same order back so that you get the same. Uh, same kind of a like like correspondence yeah. between the input and the output, but but basically now you do the mapping in parallel. Okay, so let's now go to the exercise. So there's an exercise one where you use multiprocessing, um, and then you can also move on to exercise two, which is more of a discussion um, about running on a cluster. So. Um, a cluster is a a supercomputer. It's a it's a system with a lot a lot of computers uh, in a fast network. Um, but yeah, mainly uh, per, uh, do exercise one, and then if you have extra time, take a look at exercise two. So um, we'll have fifteen minutes for it. So and during the exercise, we'll past. we'll try to answer any unanswered questions in the hack um, in the notes and we'll uh, bring them up after the uh, if there's anything interesting or any okay. especially okay. good questions we'll raise them up okay so that's it for now see you in 15 minutes bye bye um, so yeah there was one more thing we wanted to mention before MPI um which is that a lot of the libraries, like we mentioned in the beginning, a, a lot of the libraries have um, some sort of parallelism built in, usually multi-threading. Um, and often it just works out of the box, um, but also there are ways of setting the number of workers and uh, yeah, using yeah. Like parallelism through some settings. So do you have- And yeah, example? it's usually, usually a good idea to use this, like. Like the developers of the packages, they have most likely tested that this parallelism actually speeds up the code. So it's instead of like making some parallelism outside of the what the developers have intended, using their method is most likely the most efficient way of getting parallelism. So for example, like just like an example <coughs> library that you might encounter is like uh, Ski Git Learn if you're doing like uh, um, machine learning or data data analysis and that sort of stuff putting models there. And let's say we are in the user guide, if it's, we just go to the user guide. Like this is what, like when people ask about parallelism, this is what I usually do. I, I open the packet space and then I press control F to search. And then I search for parallel 
and there's a like a page on parallelism here. And if we look at here, they mentioned that they're using this joblib library, which is similar to, or it's built upon multiprocessing. It's a nice library. We'll mention other tools like this in the in the notes uh, after the MPI session. Uh, but basically, it says that there's this n jobs parameter, like uh, on estimators that you can like you can put it there, and then it uses parallelism basically. In it. And then you can you also use this uh, this higher level parallelism oh, and, and, and these open MP stuff and, and they have various ways they explain like uh how do you get the best performance. So it's usually a good idea to check check the guide whether is 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 parallel mentioned anything. Parallel is the magic word a uh, word usually uh that, that can be found in various documentations and and you can then like use that. <laughs> uh, um Another thing that, uh, so in, in the notes, I think it's good to mention. Um, so the some uh, at least one person got an error that uh, from uh, multiprocessing is library name, uh, that it cannot pickle the object something. And that happens because like what we mentioned, Python actually doesn't allow multiple processes. Um, so they cannot actually just read memory um, or read the same memory. So what multiprocessing does to get around this is that it uh, essentially writes the function and everything it needs to run that function to disk, starts another Python process, and then that Python process reads it from the disk. Or if it's like, if, if you, the disk can be on RAM, so it, the file can be in uh, fast memory, but still it needs to be possible to write it to disk. Um, and that, the main thing is that that causes some restrictions. So, so sometimes things just don't work. And like, there's ways of getting around this. You can read the instructions or try to ask people, but it gets a bit complicated. Yeah. And in general, like, like let's say you have a function <clears throat> that does like co really complex things and that sort of thing. If you want to run it in parallel, all of the different parallel processes need to know about that function and what the function has eaten, like if it uses like global variables or whatever, all of that needs to be transferred to that other process. So so the more complex your parallel thing is, the harder it is usually to parallelize. Yeah. So, so usually it's a good idea to to like parallelize. Keep it yeah, keep it simple. Like have a have a simple function that will be executed in parallel so, and then return to like a bigger program or something like that. Um so basically, like if it's a the method, if it's a method of a class, it needs the entire class. If it uses a global variable, it needs the entire file. And if you if you're calling multiprocessing from that same file, it will just fail. Um, so one way around this often is to just move the function that you're running into a different file, and often that will help, but sometimes not. So just yeah, just be aware of that. Um, it gets complicated and try to use parallelism from inside the uh, existing libraries rather than writing your own, if possible. Now, MPI, though, is um, MPI is usually not built into the libraries for a, uh, a very important reason, which is that it always needs to be run with this MPI run uh, program, basically, um, that sets up an environment for. So, so what MPI does, it, it runs completely separate processes and then tells them some information about the other processes so that they can communicate. So this can be running on completely different parts of complete, completely different computers as long as they know the IP address to the other computer and like there's an Ethernet cable or Wi-Fi connection or something so that they can communicate. Of course, that would be quite slow if you uh, send a lot of information back and forth. But um, in principle, that is something you can do. So MPI is a kind of a, a very different paradigm because you just run copies of the program. So like and all the copies run everything from the beginning. All the copies run all of your code, basically. Um, that's the main difference. Whereas in multiprocessing, it just uh, takes the function and tries to put it in a file and read that file and run it. With MPI, everything will, all of the copies will run everything unless you tell them specifically to not do that. There are um, other other like frameworks as well that work in a similar way that they basically they like 
set up some network configuration and they they do their own configuration. For example, like PyTorch has a torch run and there's a Ray, which is this parallel library as well. But there's many yeah. frameworks that do this kind of like everybody starts and then they just know about where the others are. Yeah. <laughs> they they dis they they communicate in some way. Many like in MPI's case, the MPI will handle this. Okay, who are you? Like where are you? But in many other cases, you might have like master processes and and like clients so connecting to server for MPI. Um, I mean, MPI is kind of the lowest level. It, it's kind of the basis again. Like multiprocessing is basis of a lot of libraries. Uh, MPI also is the basis for a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So okay, so we'll just uh, show a quick example. But this is something you may not be able to run because it requires that you install not just the Python library, but also um, also you need to install like MPI as a, um, a as a sort of a system level library, it's not written in Python. So it's possible to do it in Conda, but uh, we don't assume that you have done that. You can try, uh, maybe you have the functions or not. Okay, so what Simo is doing here is um, for first um, importing MPI for Pi. And then um, there's some magic stuff that, uh, I mean, yeah, you, I could explain what those things are doing. But the main thing is that uh, you get the size, which is the number of processors that are running this program. And then you get the rank, which is the unique identifier for this particular um, copy. It's a number from zero to size, basically. So that's what you have to work with, really. Um, you, you have a single number that identifies this particular copy. And then, well, then there are MPI functions that allow you to send information to other copies. You have to know the number of the other copy. So from these building blocks, you can build a lot of stuff, of course, but like you, it, it takes a bit of work. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's just try this. So this is just printing the uh, the rank, the identifier number, and the number of processes. And to run an MPI program, you need to use MPI run. And you can give it a number. Okay. Oh. Well, I gave it the wrong. Fun, uh, wrong uh, name. Oh, yes. Yeah. You need to give it the correct correct program. It will run better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you try to run the wrong program, it will not run as well. That's... Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. That's a good hint. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So it ran two copies of the program. One of them has um, identifier one, and the other one has identifier zero. Like uh, so, if you were, for example, like doing what we were doing previously. Uh, where you split this list into two multiple processes, you would need to have perhaps just, uh, usually you just uh, set it up with process number zero, and then you send a part of, you, you You actually have to write manually write the code to send the part of the list to the other process. Uh, we'll do a different example. Uh, let's just, um, let's just run the example in the notes. Um, yes. It has all of the stuff that we just ran, oh, but it's also yeah, like the different. Um, so yeah, okay. So yeah, the different so um, identifies the different processes are now doing a different thing. Yeah. And so in the so end, it's being yeah. Collected. So so yes. So so all of this code, what's what's important in the code basically, like we have the function that all of them will run independently, and all of them will will do. Uh, will do their own, like they, they they do their own part of the the whole thing but the important part is here in the line 39 where we have this communication gather so basically we gather everything and then we have this root so we gather all of that information to to the processor zero so so you can have this kind of like collective everybody send the information to the process zero and the process zero will yeah. then print uh, so that's an example of one of these functions that allow the processes to communicate with each other. Um, there's also like a send, for example, that just means one process sends information to one other process. Okay. Um, I guess so. we don't probably don't want to go too much into detail about this yeah. because we also want to spend some time yeah. on 
about the rest of the yeah. material. I, so yeah, I'll, I'll quickly mention that the MPI is commonly used in like scientific codes and that sort of things where you might have like a grid or like collective like you call it solve some problem in a in a big grid or something like that where everybody talks to their neighbors but the communication how do you communicate it depends heavily on the problem so so like you need to like usually write the communicate like who who tells who what information you need to like based on your problem you usually need to like uh decide <laughs> decide yourself so, how to do it so like there's one big rule of thumb um, when it comes to multi-threading or multi-processing and API, which is because multi-threading and multi-processing usually run a very small part, like a single for loop in parallel, whereas MPI will run all of the code in parallel. So in MPI, you want to split at the like highest level possible. Um, so as much as possible gets split between the processes and then they're just like, occasionally sending messages to each other. Uh, in multi-threading, you want, basically, you want to parallelize the smallest loop or like a, one, loop, one loop at a time. Um, so they, can, they tend to be used quite differently. And that's also the reason why often the libraries are parallelized with these multi-threading, multi-processing things, and not with MPI. But if you're using MPI, then you usually have to do it yourself. Um, or use something that's specifically intended with MPI. Um, okay, so another thing is, um, like we said, um, a lot of libraries are using uh, multi-threading, and the way the reason they can do it efficiently is because they're not written in Python. Uh, so like Python needs to use this multi-threading or multi-processing approach because it can only like one process can only run at a time. But in C, C++, Fortran, whatever, um, when in all of these like fast compiled languages, uh, you can run multiple threads at a time. Uh, you, multiple threads can run code at, at the same time. So like almost everything is written uh, like has a back end that runs the fast parts using these these libraries, uh, using these uh, using libraries written in these languages. So if you ended up, up in a situation where you need to kind of extend those libraries a bit, um, there's multiple ways of using, uh, writing C, C++, code, Fortran, Rust, um, and then calling that from Python to uh, to get the thing, the thing done. There, so there you, are you also- call your library from Python. Yeah. There are also like Python libraries such as Namba and uh, Jax nowadays. Uh, that that can do stuff like just in time compilation where they like take your python function and then they compile it into a faster c function without you ever have leaving python but but yeah. they are uh, they need additional things usually or you need to your code needs to be written in a way that it can be yeah. compiled so not be like generic python code or so. doesn't exactly support general python you, it, it's mm -hmm. a subset of Python that you have to use, but it allows you to write the program, uh, write the function in Python, and then like run it as if it was written in C, which is really convenient and yeah. usually actually the first thing you would want to do or, or try. Yeah. And before before we leave for a break, uh, we can mention Dask as well. So so if you're dealing with like big like pandas data frames like if you have a lot of data that you need to process uh dusk is this kind of like like um improvement on pandas or like more parallelizable version of pandas that allows uh the the pro like what what it does basically is that when you set in in your pandas code or whatever you set like select certain rows here calculate average of them and whatever you you, you have some operations that you do uh, but Dusk can create this kind of like a computational graph out of it, and then it can execute it in parallel. So let's say uh, it will run uh, like the data in pieces or something like that, and it can handle the parallelism on the back end. And, and if you're dealing with large data sets, like, like, like big data sets of data frames, uh, it's, it's a very useful tool and it's used in like banks and that sort of stuff because it's 
it's it makes it possible to analyze like huge amounts of let's say customer data or something like that. Um, so I started a list of useful libraries for par uh, parallel Python libraries. Um, and I wrote that the task is useful for large data sets. Um, this is a job paper, which is, I guess, um, an easier way of doing maps with uh, multiprocessing. I guess it probably does other things as well. Yes, so we'll... we'll uh... We'll continue adding more stuff there. And if you have yeah. any more questions, just put them. Yeah. And the uh, please add um, any library you know of or you use that we may not know of yet, because that's always good to keep up to date. Yeah. And also, if you, uh, at the end of the day, if you have some certain cases that you would want us to present, or certain libraries you would want us to present in the coming years, let us know, because uh, there's so many of these nowadays, so it's hard to say uh, what are the most important ones uh, for our users, but what sort of use cases you want us to demonstrate. But, okay, otherwise, um, yeah. so we intentionally left a good amount of time for discussion here. So um, looking for questions in the, um, in the notes that we might want to bring up. Uh, um, there's a... There's a question there, like how can I install OpenMPI? Well, Conda has a OpenMPI installation package there in it. So you can just Conda, inst Consta Conda install OpenMPI, at least from Conda Forge, uh, and MPI for Pi as well. And that's, I would highly recommend using that compared to like installing MPI for Pi yourself, unless you're using it in a very large scenario in a computational cluster or something. But if you want to work in in like, one machine or something like that. Uh, the MPI in the uh, in Conda is good uh, good enough in most cases. Like, uh, or if you have a if you're working in a computational cluster, the maintainers of that cluster will usually provide you with an MPI already because they, it needs extra stuff no, <laughs> to be able to multiple. be. I mean, there will probably be multiple versions you can choose from. Um, another one. So. This is answered in notes, but um, benchmarking libraries, because we talk a good bit in the beginning about how before thinking about parallelizing, you should do benchmarking and try to just make the code faster with the existing libraries, um, which is usually enough. Um, so if, if you have a, one specific function, you know you want to benchmark, then time it is a really good uh, library. Um, and if you have an entire code or when, when you're starting, you basically, you just have one entire code. You want to figure out what is the uh, slow part in that code, then scaling is a good option. Um, so that's on like this question, mark this question number nine, but should we, is it easy to find in notes? Yeah, I added to, to the libraries list. Okay, good. Uh, so it's benchmarking and yeah. Guidelines for deciding knowing in what way I should parallelize my code. I would say like the first thing is, is like, like check out the embarrassingly parallel. That's usually the most efficient way of parallelization because it's yeah. like, like, like if you have a like a uh, like a like a natural natural thing in your code that that is like embarrassingly parallelizable, like uh, um, like like for example, you run it with multiple parameters, multiple data sets, then that is usually the way to go because that that scales infinitely basically because you can always like launch more processes yeah, as long as, as, you, long have as you have data, parameters. Right? Yeah, as long yeah, as you have more data. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, after that, like I would say, probably check the libraries that you're using, whether they support parallelization. But yeah, so then if and if a single case just takes too long to run, it's like several days or... So if you're running on a cluster or on a supercomputer, you can usually reserve it for a few days. But then if something breaks, you might lose everything. So it's important to build in some checkpointing. So write everything to disk so that you have to restart it. It can continue from where it was. Where it was, um, that's already a very useful 
Um, it's not parallelization exactly, but it just allows you to run for longer. Um, and then, yeah, if then if it still takes way too long and um, then you just need to make it faster and you might need to parallelize in some way. Hmm. And then yeah. Um, yeah, if no there's a way of like, if there's a way of splitting the data, like if it's if you're running a simulation with a grid of points, you can split those points um, and run independently for each of those points. That's a good case for MPI, possibly. Um, if you have big loops over a lot of small things inside, uh, those you might be able to parallelize with um, multi-threading options. So basically, though, um, well, the multi-threading multi thing basically means use libraries that are multi-threaded, which means NumPy, uh, SciPy, mm, Torch, TensorFlow, mm. whatever. It depends on what you're doing. Um, but almost everything is multi-threaded if, if it does a lot of calculations. So just try to combine calls to NumPy, for example. If you have multiple calls to NumPy with the same data, try to make it one call um, so that you, it doesn't get yeah. split. One one thing that also, there's, there's a few questions in the, in the chat about like the multiprocessing example, uh, like locking up forever. It might be due to the Jupyter locking, locking the GIL. Uh, the global interpreter log, what what we were talking about, because like you have a if you have a Jupyter, you have a Jupyter lab running Python interpreter, and then then you try to run multiprocessing there. It might be that the Jupyter and and it, how it processes the cells and that sort of thing, it it should work, but there might be a situation where it somehow locks locks the global interpreter log, uh, so that that might might happen. And but but. Okay. It's it's hard to say. We we'll check the examples yeah. and we we'll verify that. There's at least two two questions about this. Yeah. So we'll verify. Yeah. If the solution, like if you if you take the solution from the web page and it, it doesn't work, then uh, it might be. Yeah. It, you might want to check compared to the solution. Okay. Um. We are out of time though. So let's take a break, and then we'll move yeah. on to packaging. Yeah. I'll quickly mention that there that there was also like a question about a pooling, like pool one getting bad results or, or like using pool was worse than not using pool. And and this is exactly what ha might happen in a case where you parallelize a thing that do actually doesn't benefit from parallelization. So yeah. the example, of course, is like a trivial example that we have. So it's it's a very like it, the processor will just go through it in in an in, in instant anyways like it's it's going to be like nanoseconds or microseconds or something to to calculate it so so adding like the con constructions of okay we'll construct the parallel pool and then we'll give every everyone their own uh, own process to run it's, it's it's a huge amount of overhead but the thing happens is that when like when when you, we are getting to the run times of of seconds or minutes, then then suddenly the overhead isn't that big. But usually you need to figure out what is the part in the code that uh, that requires me to parallelize it. And yeah. and usually the also uh, I'll mention that that for example the map thing, writing it as a numpy array and then just querying the numpy array <laughs> would be much faster than any pooling because like numpy already does the parallelization inside so. Not not using Python objects, but but using NumPy, I guess, would be always faster than doing the pooling thing. So so yeah. like, it's it's a trivial example, but it's just to demonstrate how to use the tools. Yeah. Okay. Um. But yeah. So we are out of time. So yeah. yeah. Um. So do take a break. Um. And uh, walk around a bit. Let's come back in ten minutes. Yep. All right. Bye.